I'm, I'm sorry, we've had some technical uh, difficulties. Um, uh, Earl was going to uh, address the social insurance appreciation hour, which is at five o'clock uh, today. Um, and uh, if you've already purchased a uh, ticket or sponsorship for the full ball award campaign, uh, you've already received the donation link. And uh, I believe at the end, we can also come back and, and revisit this. Uh, so with that, let's begin the session. Uh, we have three wonderful panelists here today. Uh, and starting off, as, as uh, mentioned, Congressman uh, Earl Pomeroy, and, and uh, I will introduce all three panelists, and then we'll, we'll go in turn. Uh, so um, we are looking at three legislative battles over the past two decades that will inform how social insurance programs in the future are discussed on Capitol Hill. Uh, one piece of legislation never really got moving. Another was approved, but financially unsustainable, and the third has been enacted into law, but still faces constant legislative and judicial challenges today. Uh, I worked in the House during the Social Security privatization efforts and was at the Senate Aging Committee right after the passage of the Class Act and Affordable Care Act. So I have some sense of how these battles played out on the Hill and in public, but our panelists today were in the trenches and will provide invaluable insights for us today uh, that will hopefully help guide our thinking about future social insurance battles to come. So uh, Earl Pomeroy is our first panelist. He served nine terms as a North Dakota's sole House member from 1993 to 2010. Uh, he served on the House Ways and Means Committee there, which uh, they have oversight over Social Security, and that's what he's going to speak about today. Uh, but Congressman Pomeroy also has a wealth of experiences from his role as a state insurance commissioner and president of the uh, National Association of Insurance Commissioners to his role today as a senior counsel at Alston and Bird, where he focuses on a range of financial regulatory issues. Uh, we'll then turn to Elizabeth Fowler for a discussion on the passage and implementation of the Affordable Care Act. Uh, Elizabeth is currently the executive vice president for programs at the Commonwealth Fund, um, and she uh, joined there last year after serving as vice president for global health policy at Johnson & Johnson. Uh, what we will ask her to lean on today, however, is her background in the executive and legislative arenas. She uh, spent uh, a fair amount of time in the Obama administration working on health care and economic policy at the National Economic Council and helped implement the ACA at the Department of Health and Human Services. And prior to that, served as Chief Health Counsel to then Senate Finance Committee Chair Max Baucus. And our final topic will revolve around the CLASS Act, uh, Community Living Assistance Services and Supports Act. Uh, our panelist here is uh, Connie Garner, and she specializes in healthcare, uh, disability, and long-term care policy, among other issues, as a senior policy director at Foley HOAG. Uh, Connie also serves as executive director of Allies for Independence, a nonprofit coalition dedicated to addressing long-term service and supports needs in the disability and aging community. Uh, again, we'll look to Connie's legislative history, 17 years as policy director for the disability and special populations for the Senate Help Committee, and most specifically for today's purposes, the lead Democratic Committee architect for the Class Act. Uh, in addition to this work, Connie also has on the ground experience as a hospital and community public health nurse practitioner. And, um, so we are going one by one with the panelists. Uh, each one has been asked to speak on each topic, but they, they can weigh in on others. I think they've all worked kind of on each of these issues in some form or fashion. Um, so let's begin with Congressman uh, Pomeroy and, and take you back to 2005. Uh, George W. Bush was just reelected. Uh, he promised famously to spend all of his political capital uh, that he had earned. Uh, Earl, would you mind taking us through where you were at that point? and your role in fighting against the push for private accounts to replace the social security system we know today. I, I sure will, you know, and uh, just to launch this session, let me just observe uh, how, how much I enjoy association with the Academy members, uh, each of whom have really earned their stripes relative to trying to advance this whole notion of social insurance. Uh, to cover briefly, just, I mean, in a second, what I was supposed to talk about, but I forgot. This appreciation hour, social insurance appreciation hour, I call it the Bob Ball, the Bob Highball Hour. Uh, I want it to be like one of these kind of book clubs where you get together maybe with a, a libation of some sort. And we, we talk, because what I've loved about these meetings in the past is you listen to interesting presentations and thought-provoking ones, and then you want to talk 
a little bit yourself uh, with, well, with, with other people that have similar backgrounds. We hope to achieve that. Your time to talk coming up at five. So, but now it's my time to talk. So let me launch. Uh, you know, I was insurance commissioner. Why did I run for insurance commissioner in North Dakota? I didn't think I could get elected attorney general. That's why. Well, what I found, however, was social was it was insurance was a really interesting uh, industry to come to know well, and I came at it without any background at all. Uh, but it was the manner by which risk is managed across a modern economy. But moreover, it really instructed me about this whole concept of risk and how risk, which is really too big to, to handle individually or at a household level, can become manageable when spread. Uh, that is the, essentially the essence of any concept of insurance in a modern economy, but it also is, is, is at, at the core of social insurance, uh, spreading risk across the society. I like to think of it as all of us protecting each of us. Uh, not an entitled, you know, it's entitled in terms of the, the status you can't take it away, but it is earned and it is a means of managing the immutable risks of life. No more program uh, 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 is more important or does this better, in my opinion, than social insurance. And one of the reasons we, Bob Ball is the highest honor, the Bob Ball Awards, the highest honor of this group is because we, we, we <laughs> We still practically revere the guy for his contribution to taking the FDR program, improving it, honing it, deepening its political support for decades. Uh, we view it as our legacy to continue that. I felt that very strongly, quite frankly, as a member of the Ways and Means Committee, uh, when the I got some capital, I'm going to spend it. We're going to create private investment accounts within Social Security. It all sounded pretty popular, uh, announced by a newly reelected president who had achieved more than 60 percent of the vote in the state I was elected to represent. Uh, but I knew one thing, and I knew it really in my uh, core. Uh, believe me, you come from North Dakota as a Democrat. When, well, that string ultimately ran out. But I, I, for 18 years, I was able to do that. And, and, and so you don't cross the White House in obvious and high profile ways often, but I knew the president was wrong here. I knew his advisors had misled him here. I, I, I knew that he didn't appreciate risk and people's anxieties about risk like I did, uh, particularly the social security risks, uh, which we all know, uh, you know uh, frankly, uh, uh, a, a, an assured income stream for life, protection against living too long, outliving your resources, protections, against disability in the workplace, the, the principal form of disability coverage most workers in the workforce have today. Survivor's benefits, something that as, as a teen when I lost my father, uh, our family came to know firsthand. So this was so much more fundamental in people's importance to notions of investment opportunity from a private account. I knew that they were wrong. They were absolutely wrong. Now, the president announced this the morning. The, well, he announced it at the State of the Union address and then flew to Fargo, North Dakota, where he was greet, greeted with rapturous applause in, in an arena that actually did sell out. Uh, and, the, uh, and they gave him a very warm reception. He flew away. At that very time, I was running around the state that day and then the days to follow having town meetings on this dangerous social security privatization, watering down the coverage risk people had from this essential program. I did that without a speck of trepidation because I knew that they missed it. And the, the, I think the core is, first of all, these are immutable risks of life. One in six has social security. That, prob that probably is a little higher in the state with a higher aging percentage like North Dakota. Uh, so that, it's a program they know well. Uh, they've known it for generations. They count on it. I don't want anyone messing with Social Security. Uh, the president, in his, uh, you have to forgive me, I got kind of flawed internet that kicks in and out, but uh, you can hear me, I trust. Yes. Uh, sure. the, uh, the, the president uh, flew around the country trying to sell this idea. 
And the more um, uh, the uh, uh, being being in the caucus meetings on the, at Capitol Hill, where we talked about pitching in some money to fuel up Air Force One to keep them flying around talking about this, because it literally became more and more unpopular the more people understood the game afoot. And and we were ultimately able to prevail uh, in that. And I think, again, I think core was Social Security spreads risk on core uh, inescapable dimensions of everyone's life. It's a program they know, they know well. So Liz is going to talk about a program that was new and unknown. Uh, you know, when people get risk and they get how they're protected, pretty hard to take that one away. When you're trying to expand the governmental response, and, and that's where we have it. it's really the, the kind of the teeing up of the issue I wanted to do, Joel. Happy to take questions and comment later. Sure. Yeah. I mean, I, I think the risk is a really important point you make there. And just one final follow up before we, we move to the next uh, part is, is you talk a lot about risk, you know, for, for individuals. And I think one of the things that's difficult to appreciate now, but in 2005, uh, this was before the recession and we had just come off a high from the 90s. And so I think there were a lot of people that thought, oh, you know, why, why not private accounts? You know, you can invest in the stock market. How, how did you address fighting back against that idea that it's it's not a great idea for us collectively to take a risk, um, not just the idea that you know Social Security as itself is a good protection for individual people against right. that? Right. Well, unfortunately, within retirement income strategies for our country, we have already posed an awful lot of risk on the individual household. We've gone from a defined benefit pension that you accrue automatically as you show up to work. Now you've got to participate with a shared savings plan, shared ideally if the if the employer participates, and then you've got to accumulate. You've got to have it. You can't. You've got to invest it, and you've invested already relative to major retirement strategies. An awful lot of risk on the households that have employer coverage at work, and fifty percent have not. Don't even have that. So what I thought was so ill advised about this plan was that it. It took the one place of retirement income. Right? We know they call it the three-legged stool. We took we took the secure part of the stool, and they wanted to saw that one off. Uh, we we need a place within the the, the various pockets uh, pillars, I should say, of retirement income strip planning for people. We've got to have one place where there's no risk at all, uh, and that's Social Security. And so, trying to interject risk into the one foundation that already didn't have it was very ill-advised as a financial planning exercise. And, you know, you don't have to have a degree in finance to kind of get that. I mean, people just understood it, which was why it didn't go at all. They went with some, you know, for the college-educated, affluent, got some money. I've done so well with my stock market investments. I want to play here, too. Yeah, there's a constituency for it, but it's not 50%, as the president learned. Right. And, and it's the safety net that you don't want to take a risk on. And, and uh, yeah, I mean, it, it certainly was a very co coordinated, concerted effort in, in 05 from uh, at least one side of the aisle to to push back. And, and obviously, I'll prevent that from, from really moving um, on to a successful legislative effort. Uh, Liz, we'll bring you in. Uh, you, you worked uh, heavily on, on the Affordable Care Act. And I want you to uh, take us back to where you were uh and 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 walk us through, you know, what that process was like. Obviously, it's still something that is very, uh, uh, you know, it's still being challenged today. But but back in those days, uh, it, it was a heavy lift, uh, certainly. Sure. Thanks. And first of all, thanks very much for inviting me. Um, I appreciate the role that NASI plays in educating and protecting social insurance programs. And and then. Just as importantly, it's always fun to reminisce. And um, this year is the ACA's 10th anniversary. So it's um, been a year and a time to reflect um, already. So this was kind of a fun uh, capstone to thinking about ACA and, and what it took to get it passed. Um, in 2009 and 2010, I was the chief health counsel for the Senate Finance Committee. Uh, one of the two committees in the Senate with jurisdiction over health care, as most people on the phone probably know. 
um, finance committees kind of the ways and means equivalent um, with all the entitlement programs um, and Social Security, um, Medicare, Medicaid, and CHIP, as well as the tax code. Um, and um, the other one, of course, is the Health Education, Labor, and Pension Committee um, with ERISA, the discretionary health programs, and individual um, the insurance market reforms. Um, so that's that's what I was doing there. Um, do you want me to talk a little bit about what it took to get it passed or what challenges we faced? Um, yeah, yeah, that would be wonderful. And, and then we can kind of bring it to, to uh, modern day and, and, and your thoughts. Sure. So I guess I would think about dividing um, challenges into two, two buckets, policy challenges and politics. And on the policy side, you know, putting together such a massive um, bill um, has it has a lot of challenges. And the goal of the legislation was to expand health coverage for as many people as possible, um, really by building on the current system and adopting from the Massachusetts model. But I'll tell you, just as many members in both the House and Senate wanted to focus on bending the growth curve of health spending. Um, so not just on in, uh, expanding coverage, but also um, addressing health care costs. So the challenge on the policy front was really trying to develop a policy that achieved both of those goals, expanding health coverage, and at the same time reducing health spending, and doing it in a fiscally responsible way that met budget targets and offset the cost of the coverage expansions. It was very difficult to make all of those pieces meet. Um, and um, I'd say the most difficult policy options to resolve, as many of you know, the public option, generosity of coverage, um, abortion, how to how to handle abortion, and then how to pay for the coverage. Um, very different visions between the House and the Senate. On the politics, um, you know, can you get Republicans on board? We tried. Uh, we were not successful, and I think that that um, you know probably speaks to some of the challenges we we still have today. Um, but um, you know, we we did our best, and we did try. We were not successful. Um, but in that case, can you get the votes you need in both the House and the Senate? The House wanted more coverage, more generous coverage. They had a public option in the, uh, their version of the bill, and they wanted to pay for coverage expansions by increasing taxes on the wealthy, among others, but that was an important part of their offsets. And the Senate was much more moderate, and the vision was, um, you know, um, ultimately the Senate bill didn't include the public option. Um, although there were strongly held views on both sides, and um, could you get stakeholders on board? Um, so compared to the Clinton era where everyone was opposed to health reform, the insurance companies, the drug companies, the hospitals, the doctors, everyone, we really worked hard to try to get a coalition of stakeholders who would actually support um, health reform, and I think that's part of what led, its, led to its success. Switching over now to implementation, you know, the challenge on the policy side was that a lot of decisions, really key decisions, were left um, to implementation. So whenever we reached a roadblock, for example, what should the essential benefits cover um, or be that are covered by plans? And instead of outlining exactly what the benefits should be, we said, well, the administration in implementation should address that issue. And so um, on implementation, and I went over from the Senate to the um, Department of Health and Human Services to work on implementation and then was handed with this, this list of things that Congress had kicked to the administration. And so there were a lot of really um, important policy decisions that had to be made um, on the implementation side. And then the politics for both passage and implementation, I think, is really a question of can you maintain public support? Um, and if you think about health care, I think Social Security is a little, maybe it's not simpler all, I'll let um, Earl talk about that, but but healthcare is really complicated and our system is really complicated. It's hard to explain. It's easy to vilify. Um, you remember the death panels, like everything was a death panel. And um, so it was really a challenge to, to make sure that the public understood what was in the law and then also to um, understand how they'd be influenced. Um, there's my dog. Um, <laughs> And uh, so I think there's a lot of lessons here for any efforts to revisit the ACA um, and also to take on reform. So lots to think about and happy to talk about that further. It's, it's interesting. Uh, and I don't know what your experience on the Hill was uh, prior to that. But I mean, did you have the understanding that as soon as you passed it, that there would be another? I mean, aside from the implementation challenges that were kind of punted to, as it was you later, um, right. 
Uh, did you have a thought at that time that this is really not the end, but only the beginning because people were going to try to take, uh, you know, some legal cracks at this? Uh, uh, how quickly did you go from celebrating to, uh, you know, fighting? You know, I think a lot of people didn't really, and maybe myself in that, maybe many people appreciated the challenges of implementation and, and maintaining that public support and explaining to the public what happened. I don't think we anticipated the level of opposition that, that came. And, you know, I worked on the Medicare drug bill in 2003, as well as um, the ACA. Um, and the Medicare drug bill was a Republican bill with a handful of Democrats, one of whom happened to be Max Baucus, who I worked um, with for on, on both of those um, bills. And most Democrats thought the Medicare drug bill was a giveaway to the drug industry. It didn't have price controls. They really had a lot of strong opposition. Um, but what, so the bill passed in 2003, was implemented in 2006. And once it was implemented, I think Democrats shifted a perspective from this is the worst you know, bill to let's try to work together and make it better and really shifted that focus to improving the law. And I think a lot of us, particularly those who had been around for a while, thought that there would be a similar pattern, that um, that at some point the Republicans would switch from this is the worst bill in the world to, OK, let's figure out you know, how to make it better and, and put their mark on implementation. It didn't happen, though. Um, there was a Supreme Court case in 2012. So it was ruled you know, constitutional. Um, and so we thought, OK, it's been affirmed. Um, the election in 2012, so um, that seemed like an affirmation of the law as well. But it didn't stop the opposition. So the, then the law was implemented. The benefits went into effect in 2014. The opposition continued. A second Supreme Court case came in 2015. We keep waiting for the time when when um, it became a recognized law of the land, and you know I think that wasn't the case. And after Trump's real um, Trump was elected in 2016, came the closest to repealing it in 2017. You know, as we all know, survived on one vote, um, and now we're awaiting a third Supreme Court case. So um, you know, I think the difference is that now the public understands um, the value of having coverage and the protections for. Um, pre-existing conditions. And in fact, a strong segment of the population wants it to go further and wants to revisit questions like the public option and, and um, you know, more financial protections. And I think we'll start seeing that um, in the House, for example, which is set to reconsider some of these coverage um, decisions. And particularly in light of the pandemic, uh, there's the opportunity to do so. And, and we ought to be having that conversation again. So, um, you know, I don't know what to say on the politics. I guess, you know, we all underestimated, um, you know, the opposition and, and how long and how furious and, and um, how lasting it would be. Yeah, it's interesting you bring up the pandemic. I mean, certainly as, as talking with Congressman, the idea that, you know, there is a real life scenario that happens that makes people recognize and realize the importance of, of you know, what has what passed and the same with the, the market crash, but the privatization, I think people then realized, oh, that was good that we probably <laughs> didn't go down that path. Um, well, and, and just one more point into the last um, panel, thinking about it, this convergence of pandemic and um, Black Lives Matter and the importance of thinking about, you know, the real heightened interest in, in focusing on health equity. Um, expanding health coverage was one of the most important, um, um, I think, improvements to help um, expand coverage, which has been a huge benefit to a lot of, um, to the Black and Hispanic communities and um, the amount of coverage and, you know, it's not a perfect law, but it has done a lot to address some of the health disparities. We have a long ways to go and at the Commonwealth Fund, we're doing a lot of thinking about that right now, um, but it's certainly a really important element there. Well, well thank you for, for your insights, and, and I will now turn it to, to Connie on our third panel, or our third uh, topic, and the Class Act, which was passed as part of ACA, uh, certainly something that, that you uh, played a large role in. And, and if you can take us back to, to that time, and I know Liz was talking about, you know, having to uh, push some big decisions down the road, uh, you know, obviously that's something that, that was part of the Class Act discussion, and I'm curious what, what you thought about at the time of implement, or at the time of passage, and what changed, obviously, uh, after passage. And if you could take up yourself uh, off mute, I think, if you are on mute. Uh, let's see. 
You're looking for Connie, right? Not me. I was looking for Connie, but uh, it, it, you might have to start talking. You about know, uh, well, Connie uh, tries to get in, and I know the panic of trying to get in. Sure. Uh, let me filibuster for a minute. Thanks, sir. Uh, the uh, well, well, Liz was over guiding uh, Chairman Baucus's efforts with the Senate Finance Committee, and they tried mightily to make this a uh, some bipartisan effort. The bill was stretched out for months. Uh, due to uh, negotiations that ultimately went nowhere. And I'll be frank about it. I don't think they were ever intended to go anywhere. Uh, but the problem with, so I talked about Social Security as a known protection against immutable risk. What do we have with a new, uh, a new program, particularly on health care? You've got a potential disruptor of what most Americans already have in place their individual private health insurance. Now, they have all kinds of gripes about it. doesn't cover enough, costs too much. It's flattened their wages. There's a lot of trouble with the way existing financing is. But for those that have it, it is existing financing. And so uh, these attacks, and we go all the way back to Hillary Clinton's effort when they w w shot down with the Thelma, not Thelma and Louise, Harry and Louise ads, that raise questions. It said uh, this bill, this is not a bill that really helps health insurance. This bill endangers your health insurance. And man, the politics flip like that when that happens. And so anybody uh, tackling an improvement of our health system in a major way sails into a very tough storm. It was one ultimately politically I didn't survive. But the concepts uh, relative to expanding coverage, uh, keeping what we've got, uh, but uh, but assuring that you have uh, protection against pre-existing subsidies to get the coverage. You know, again, tough to explain, and we didn't do it well. Uh, but uh, but the proof's in the pudding. And so this lawsuit launched by Texas at a time when well the legislative efforts had kind of failed with John McCain's famous thumbs down, and and now they had to keep the issue alive, so they filed a lawsuit. I believe that they will rue the day if somehow some set of circumstances would let them prevail on that lawsuit and all of the Affordable Care Act goes away. We'd have to quickly pass it in place, and I think there'd be a punishing blow for those that strip away what now is part of the national fabric in terms of a social insurance response to health care. Uh, subsidized coverage for those who need it, uh, guaranteed access to coverage, for all of us. And by the way, it's pretty nice having your kid on your family plan until they're 26 too. And so there's, you know, the, the, this thing, the, the polling on it, it was underwater for so long. To our surprise, we thought we passed it. They'd learn what was in it. They'd love it. And they'd love us. Wrong. Uh, very controversial for a long period of time. But ultimately, proof's in the pudding. It did not damage the coverage people had and enjoyed. Uh, and by the way, some of these protections were kind of nice. And so I now think it's got popular support and politically is uh, is not subject to the kind of danger it was in 2017. Uh, but for the Supreme, but but for the courts, we'll have to let that one take its place. The fact that uh, it's taken on a life of its own and the Republican Party has been unable to reassess whether or not just flat out trying to kill everything makes any sense at all. Uh, because I think that their best political strategists would say this doesn't make sense, but they're just locked into this frame. Got to kill it. Got to kill it. Uh, uh, you know, fortunately, I think we're going to keep them from killing it. Uh, but if they ever did win that one, they would pay a brutal price and we put something back very quickly. Well, thank you very much. That was a, a very successful filibuster, I believe. And, and you certainly earned the right to talk as much as you want about the ACA, given uh, how difficult that was on your end. Uh, Connie, it looks like you are, you, you don't appear panicked. So I think that you have. <laughs> there we well, can you do? Okay. Can you hear me now? I can hear you now. Uh, you can so, hear me. Everybody can hear me then, right? Okay. Wonderful. So uh, sorry for the technical difficulties for the folks watching, but, but to bring you back to the class act as part of yep. ACA, uh, obviously uh, your impression of things both in the build up to passage and then what happened right after. Okay, so I think it's interesting kind of how the whole class act came about. Um, it really was an add-on, an add-on consideration to two earlier pieces of legislation. 
Um, and Joe, you can hear me now, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, okay. Um, so as an earlier, the original piece of legislation that began to bring this thought forward was a bill called Ticket to Work and Work Incentive Improvement Act. And it was really meant to allow people, particularly with disabilities, um, to be able to go to work and not have to continue to be put in a situation where they have to be essentially poor and significant to get access to the services that they need. Now, to this day, that's really has not changed yet. It's improved a bit, but, you know, it still becomes an issue when Medicaid, for example, is the only game in town when you need to have uh, services and supports for functional uh, and healthcare issues. So as we began to do the ticket to work and we put buy-in, we put a buy-in program in there for Medicaid and we passed that. That was generally for adults and it was for working adults. And that was that. The next bill that came along um, was a bill called Family Opportunity Act. And it was really meant to address the issue of kids. You had families. And I think one was a very interesting family in, uh, in Senator uh, Grassley's district, um, a family where it was a mother and two children, boy in high school, and then a younger boy who was in grade school. And what happened with them was the mother wound up getting divorced and the boy had some significant disabilities and needed to really orthopedically have leg extensions done. They moved from Iowa, they moved from Iowa to Baltimore to go to Johns Hopkins. And while they were there, the high school boy went to McDonald's to get a job. But what it wound up doing, his dollars wound up putting them over. And this is similar to what Representative Pomeroy was talking about, that 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 one issue put him over. Uh, the family over the income eligibility for uh, to be able to continue to have Social Security and Medicaid for that child. So when Senator Kennedy and Senator Grassley, who this is an interesting issue for them to work on together, heard about that, they said, that's, that's unacceptable in this country. And why are we making that mother have to stop getting raises, turn down, you know, promotions um, so that her boy can get the health care that he needs. So that so then we, we we did that bill. And then I remember we started thinking, well, there's probably more to it than that. And so the original draft of um, Class Act, Community Living Assistance Services and Supports, was truly targeted at the disability community under 65. That was really what it was originally put together for, to try to get people who were able and could work and did not have to be necessarily dependent on Medicaid, except for the fact that that was the only option that was available to them, to try to see what could we do to put a program in place a social insurance program in place, uh, knowing that there was risk. And I think, you know, uh, Representative Palmer pointed out all the issues of risk. And we had the same, of course, big issues of risk in this. Um, was there, was policy question was, was there something we could put together to offer another alternative to those folks? The private insurance industry was not going to be a consideration for them because the risk and the risk assessment on them would, would, would ace them out of that program to begin with. And so this was an effort to try to do that. Well, as we began to discuss what should this be, how should this look? We looked at all of the programs uh, internationally. Um, it was the very beginning, I think, of when Australia was beginning to put their um, self-direction program together. Um, for under 65, which is how they started. They did not start with an over 65 program. They started with an under 65 program. Um, we began to do this. Well, the aging community came and said, hey, wait, you know, we need to be part of this too. We need, and so that began then to develop what class looked like. Um, we worked hard. I guess the most disappointing part of Class Act was that we had over, we built it in a different way than legislation is generally built. It wasn't built in a room with legislative staff. It wasn't built that way. It really brought in real people in real neighborhoods. And we wound up having over 300 groups that supported this notion of a cash, of a cash type plan to be able to give people the ability to choose what they wanted to choose, whether it was to use it for a premium for an insurance policy or whether it was to help them in an assisted living facility or whatever the case may be. Um, those groups spread all the way from, you know, religious groups, provider groups, disability groups, but it, and they came and we spent two hours, three times a week. So that the people who supported that, that piece of legislation and that notion, that concept of it actually, actually knew almost every line and word in it. And so when people would say, how would something like this ever got passed? It got passed because those are the people that had to pay for it. And those are the people that wanted an opportunity at that kind of a model. And so um, and they, in fact, still have stayed. They're still interested in it. They still want to see, 
this particular issue dealt with in a different way than we generally see. So that was kind of what happened with it. What were some of the challenges and lessons learned in it? Quite a bit, quite a bit. Number one, the amount of politics that went into that bill was just kind of difficult, but it was what it was. The other thing was this issue of risk and how do you get an investment in risk? Because really you could purchase an insurance policy with this money that could, that could you know, meet your needs. But then the question was always, you know, well, who's going to insure these? Who wants to take that quote unquote risk? And that was kind of an issue. Um, the good news about it was we were trying very hard so that Medicaid as a system would, would not continue to be overburdened to the point where we didn't have an alternative other than Medicaid. And that was the one place people had to go. So that was a, that was a good recognition of that. And then I think the other piece that was really important was that uh, lessons learned that was a good thing was it was the first opportunity we had to bring the aging and disability community, both as communities together to work on something that they both believed in. And I think that was a real important issue and the lesson of, of, of how important it is to really get grassroots, real people in real neighborhoods involved in these kind of conversations, particularly when they're liable and they're the ones that have to pay the premium for these products. Okay, we don't have all the answers, you know, all the time. And, and, and that's an issue. So those were kind of the lessons learned as we walked away from it. And, you know, you win some, you lose some. And we certainly know that. But as we walked away from it, we really were hoping and we still hope that it's not a dead issue. And that long-term care, long-term services and supports would be looked at. We're looking now at home and community-based services. If 90% of people in the aging community really and the disability community are, are in the home and in the community, and only, what, 10%, a little less than 10% are in more of an organized environment, you know, where's the money? Where's the shift? Where's the, you know, wh where are we going to get the money for the 90% that are not? We also wondered, too. We also wonder, ponder this, is had it, had it stayed in and had it not been repealed and had the administration been able to move it around and do things with it so that it responded to the milieu of the day, what would things look like now? What would, would the congregate setting issue still be as dramatic as it is? Would people have accepted, you know, maybe we should try doing something a little bit different and here's dollars to, to go along with it? So there always is that kind of interest in that. Um, and so that's kind of what the history was. Did we walk away from it? No. Did you know, I worked for Ted Kennedy and I learned very early on uh, his philosophy that you don't walk away from an issue. You know, if you don't win it, you go back again and again and again and eventually something will happen. Um, should we have put it on the ACA? That's, that's its own question. Uh, he believed it should go on there. And the reason is he said it may not. He said this is before he died. He said it may not stay on there. It may not even go. But if you don't put it on there. The reason that people need to hear about integrated care, thinking about health care along a continuum, not just acute illness and injury and prevention, will go away. So even if it goes away, it's OK, as long as it keeps that issue on the table, because I can tell you as being a nurse practitioner, your acute illness and injury methods and prevention only you need to have those longer term services and supports included in that integrated model to get people back to functioning to where they where they where they were or where they can be. And we don't have that when we have strictly an acute illness and injury uh, kind of a, of a system. So, you know, we would hope that it would still continue. The same people that were um, that were behind it and wanted it back then are still together and they still want it now, which someday I'm going to write a book about this this group that you cannot disperse. You cannot get rid of them. You know, they're not going anywhere. They're staying until this issue is addressed in a, in a productive way for them. But I think the other thing that we learned, that I learned, right, Liz probably knew this all along, but um, how hard it is to construct a bill when your assumptions change and when you have different actuarial groups who have very different assumptions. And that was one of the issues that we ran into. The assumptions that CBO had were not the same assumptions that the the private insurer actuarial folks had on the outside. And so you're kind of stuck with like, well, what, you know, who's right, who's wrong here, who has the actual thing. And for this issue, it's really interesting because the assumptions shouldn't have been that different, you know, depending on whatever it was, it just shouldn't have been that different, but they were. And so, um, so that was one of the lessons that was kind of interesting to learn. But I will tell you, I walked away from that with the biggest message to me when I walked away from that was the value of going to the real people that you're intending on impacting to develop a piece of legislation. To not do that is wasting your time. And these guys really worked hard. They worked together. They're still there. They're still waiting to work on this and do something good on this issue. 
Um, home and community-based services, again, has always been the focus. And that doesn't mean, though, that nursing home and nursing home reform isn't important for the people who need that available option as well. So hopefully we're not walking away from it, Joel. And uh, particularly after everything we've seen, we'll come back to that and begin to look at it again. Yeah, I'm curious about kind of the the, the juxtaposition of, of where you were and Liz was at that time. You know, she said she wasn't really anticipating, you know, certainly not a 10-year fight. Uh, mm -hmm. Probably were anticipating, uh, you know, pushback past the passage. Uh, what what were you expecting to happen and how, how hard of a fight were you expecting to, to continue to have to, to make? Well, it was, you know, as you know, as you look at the history books, it was a very big fight even to get it included in health care reform. It bypassed a lot of the normal ways that a piece gets into a piece of legislation. It came out of the hopper the same way almost that it went in. And so that's why the only redeeming value of that was that we weren't, we weren't intending to hand over to the administration something that was, that was drafted so tight that they had nowhere to go with it. We wanted it to, to be open enough that they would be able to move it in a more fluid way, depending on what was happening in the country. Um, you know, I worked for a while in the administration, and it's really hard when you're handed a piece of legislation that is so tight that you've got nowhere to go with it from a regulatory point of view, even. So, um, so you know, that's I think, you know, we thought about that. We didn't think it would get repealed after it passed. That's for sure. Um, and we were just hoping that people would take the time, since it missed a lot of those steps in the process, take the time to be able to, you know, kind of like a piece of silly putty, move it around and make it work. Um, there were folks who did shed light on the fact that from an actuarial point of view, you could do things with it that would, that would make it solvent, but there was no entertainment of that because nobody wanted, and I understand that, nobody wanted to have this be the reason that the ACA would go down. And so, I mean, it was as much as, as one would say, well, it's an extra piece on the ACA, and, and I understand that as well. It is, but I think we got to come back to what integrated care and a healthcare system looks like eventually. And this is a huge piece of it. Um, so, I mean, that's, that's, I mean, no one wants to think it was going to, was going to get repealed. And particularly at 10 minutes to 12 on New Year's Eve, that was even more kind of fascinating. So, yeah. Um, what? Uh, Joel, let me, I, I would just respond briefly. Uh, yeah. From and I really admire uh, Senator Kennedy will always be my hero, um, and the effort to respond to long term the need of long term services support assistance for the American people is I, I think the great next risk that we have to respond to. Uh, but but CARES, in my opinion, had the issue right and the financing wrong, and that's what it ultimately fell apart. Could it have been massaged and, and, and fixed? It, it, it probably could have. But I do think that the issue raises the point. There's a bandwidth issue, even yes. in the federal government of the United States of America. Yes. HHS was swamped. And they didn't always, uh, you know, I think the administration, I've been, I've been a little critical of them, and I'll be critical right now. I, I, I think that they fumbled the ball in important ways. We all remember the painful computer rollout. They just lost a very substantial, not they just lost, the, a very substantial ruling in the Supreme Court, eight to one, showed that the risk corridors, which they allowed to be negotiated away by a, a portion of the, the Congress that yielded to Republican, a vicious Republican attack, and they let it go as part of a, an omnibus bill, and it outwent the uh, risk corridor protections on soar, uh, creating soaring premiums and uh, departing insurers within the the uh, health exchanges. They all reflect that the, the the administration had its hands full, and not always executing perfectly with what it had. And and, and class was just a bridge too far. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. The right issue again, but but beyond the beyond the ability of, of what we had on the field uh, in terms of just numbers and capacity uh, to deal with it. That's my view. Liz, do you I have something to that. pitch I do in appreciate there? That. I do appreciate that. And I think that you're absolutely right about that. Um, the other thing that I think happened with Class Act, as I look back at it retrospectively, it was too big. And it really was trying to, as I looked back, I'm like, oh, why did we have, like, we didn't need to deal with this. We didn't, I mean, we really kind of, it just began to get more and more things that needed to be discussed in it, that retrospectively, I think we could have carved it back and kept it more targeted. 
uh, and that may have made a little bit of a difference as well. So I absolutely do think, uh, Representative Pomeroy, that you're right, Congressman Pomeroy, on, on that perspective. Um, it was a lot. It was, and it got bigger, it got bigger than it was originally intended. <laughs> um, but I think, I think there are two things that are important about what it represented. You know, I already stressed the fact that it represented what real people wanted and they didn't have an opportunity because we didn't want to work on it to make it either fail or not fail. Okay, we didn't give them that opportunity. And they worked very, very hard for almost two and a half years. And these are the same people who need and we need to support whatever healthcare system is put out there because these are the folks that use it. You know, and so that was the one thing. The other thing that I think was um, was is really kind of interesting about this is the very big push for number one, self-determination models, models that give me and you and your grandparents or whoever the choice so that they're able to choose the things that work for them, which may not be the neighbor next door. And so I think that's an important piece that we learned from this as well, is to give people that choice. And I'm not sure how we do that, um, but you know that, that was a very important piece in this whole thing, that we give people choice to be able to live at home and live in their community the way they want to do it, not script it out. So well, I, I hate to stop the conversation because we're, we're, I think, having a really good back and forth here. Unfortunately, we are getting... Uh, to the close of the hour, did, did you have any last words, Liz, that you wanted to just share? Or? No, I, I um, Earl's right. Uh, agree with Earl, as you might expect, and was thinking Earl could probably have done this entire session all, all on his own. I'm not sure he needed <laughs> the rest true. of us. <laughs> Fair enough. And speaking of Look, Earl, do you, do you have the I used to go on? visit Liz when I was out of Congress and in the implementation stage, I, I, I went and visit Liz in, in her highest positions of power and influence, <laughs> trying to make all of this work. Uh, and, and so she went from Senate finance to actually the implementation stage where she played a major role. And to the extent it worked as well as it has, uh, Liz Fowler's fingerprints are all oh, over that. Thanks, Earl. I mean it. That's very nice. Uh, do you have, uh, I believe you you mentioned before you had some closing statements about the fundraiser. I do have closing. So I missed the opening, but I do have closing. <laughs> well, and this I'll actually uh, uh, is the, uh, I got a pitch for support for the National Academy of Social Insurance. And I really want you to think about this. Uh, you know, I understand that there are lots of places we can, put our donations these days. Uh, I also understand we haven't been going out to eat quite as much. <laughs> Maybe there's a little extra in the budget uh, to look at doing something. Well, the National Academy of Social Insurance is the creature of uh, none, none other than Bob Ball to create a, a essentially an enduring think tank that's going to go across the generations serving the purpose of explaining social insurance, including the great programs, Social Security, Medicare, Medicaid, and the like, uh, and uh, continuing to look at how these principles can make a better, more fair, more equitable United States for the Americans uh, in, in, in our time and those to come. And that is what the National Academy of Social Insurance is for. It's really important. And if you didn't think it was important, if you thought this is just another one of those gab fests or something, look at the people that have participated. We're so proud of our Academy membership, our Robert, our Bob Ball Award winners. Uh, we really think, I think it's the greatest collection of interesting thinkers on progressive policy in the country. It's my favorite. Uh, so we'd like you to pitch in. Now, I'm going to pitch in a little more. I paid my dues. I'll pitch in some more. Uh, and, but I'm, I'm small fry compared to some of how we're doing. See this? Look at this the thermometer that's now on your screen. We're coming up 77% of the way there, and we really appreciate all who've helped us get there. Uh, I want to call out some names. Uh, you, you call this the Jerry Lewis telethon or whatever, but uh, it, it, it really does. There are people we have to note specifically, and so these names will not be uh, strangers to you. Bob Reischauer, thank you so much. Chris O'Flynn, Howard Floor. Howard, you know, is an actuary. Uh, just, a, just an example of the the, the 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 extraordinary technical backgrounds that have contributed to social insurance over the years and continue to with the academy. Bob Rosenblatt, T.J. Sutcliffe, T.J. God bless her. 
after a long career of advocacy on behalf of uh, a nonprofit for uh, uh, the disability community, is now on the staff of the Ways and Means Social Security Subcommittee, where she continues to work on these issues, only now she's got the policy hat on. But she still finds, even in this public, uh, this, this, this public period of her compensation, an ability to make a donation. Bless you, TJ. Margaret Summers, Karen Glenn, Tom Cluda, and William Fournier. Uh, there are others, but those were the ones on my list. I'm joining them. Uh, and, and so we'd really like you to make a pledge and, and, uh, and, and think about it as this day goes on. We think about battles fought, battles won, and battles still ahead of us. So with that, Joel, I turn it back to you. Uh, uh, I do look forward to joining you uh, in this little hap- the, 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 again, the Bob Highball Hour is to come at the end, uh, and or the Social Security Appreciation Hour, I guess we're calling it, uh, 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 Social Insurance Appreciation Hour. So I look forward to talking to those of you that will end up in my breakout group. Meanwhile, fellow panelists, it's been an honor to be on the dais with you, and uh, thank you so much for listening in. Uh, thank you, guys. And thank you, Earl. Thank you, Liz. Thank you, Connie. Uh, uh, and thank you for joining us, uh, those online, uh, for the uh, 2020 Ball of War campaign kickoff. Uh, up next, we're going to have a session on what a reimagined social insurance system could look like. Uh, uh, joining that uh, panel is uh, Bill Spriggs, the 2016 Ball Award recipient, Catherine Edwards, the principal investigator of the Academy's Economic Security Panel. Jeff Cruz from the Senate Budget Committee, and Bob Posen of MIT. Uh, Bob also served with me as a judge on the Academy's and ARP's Social Security Policy Innovations Challenge last year. Hopefully there won't be any technical glitches, but if there are, please be patient with us. Thank you very much.